I need some traction. You need some traction. Awesome. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI. Today's traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI and Launch Academy. Folks, as you're joining, please introduce yourself. Tell us where you're tuning in from, what you're looking to get out of this session. Post to everyone, not just host and panelists. Make sure when you post, you post to everyone. Introduce yourself, your company, what you're looking to get out of this session. And if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A tab. I'm seeing Toronto, Vancouver, Belgium, Mexico, Calgary, over 100 people here tuned in. So if you have any questions, type them in the Q&A tab. India, Austin, wow, global audience here. Fantastic. Everyone tuning in to listen to Craig. Fantastic. So, you know, building a reputable, scalable sales organization is super, super hard. And it's like the holy grail, I guess, in B2B SaaS. And our fantastic speaker here today has done it a few times. Craig Nile, VP sales at Kodat, over 70 million in funding and previously head of enterprise sales at Slack, is going to give us the playbook for building and scaling enterprise sales teams from zero to billion. Craig, welcome to Traction. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lloyd. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So before we dive into the sales playbook and you know building and scaling enterprise sales teams from zero to billion, you've driven rapid growth for some of the biggest names in SaaS, like Salesforce, Slack, now Kodak. Um, so you've seen it all. Give us your backstory. How did you get into sales? How did you get to where you are today? Sure. Uh, so I originally didn't think I would be in sales. I had a love for math and science. I was born to two math majors that worked at IBM and I, I studied programming at first. And the more I did that, the more I realized that coding in isolation wasn't really well aligned with the nature of you know, my personality. So I pivoted, I got a business degree in the end and I cut my teeth at some startups doing sales. Uh, I was a headhunter for a short period of time, but the rest were all really like tech sales jobs, BDR roles. Um, and I joined Salesforce in 2006 and stepped into that organization. And it just, it really showed me what the machine, the model, the culture really could look like when it's done right. And um, learned a ton there. I started as an account executive, uh, about halfway through moved into leadership roles. And there was, let's see, there were 1,200 or so employees when I joined and about 500 million of ARR. So definitely not, not that zero range in terms of revenue, but uh, well on their way. And when I left, there was about uh, 25,000 employees, so massive scale and eight and a half billion dollars in revenue. Uh, I left to join Slack and at first thought, I can't leave a company like Salesforce and go sell emojis and chat. And that doesn't sound that interesting. And the more I learned about the way they were transforming organizations, the more appealing it, it clearly was. And I joined when they were about 100 million in ARR and 700 or so employees. And that was right after the CEO, Stuart, was quoted saying, we'll never hire salespeople. We don't need sales. Um, so I had the interesting task of building out the enterprise sales team for them and, and really starting to embed a, a sales motion there after the success they'd had with the product and product-led growth for so long. Uh, but uh, that is the story of, of how I got to Slack. Awesome. That's fantastic. And we'll get uh, into it. But a lot of folks like the, the, the Slacks and the Dropboxes all said, you know what, we never need a salesperson. But like you start to stall out and eventually you do need a salesperson, right? Um, uh, and salespeople and sales leadership and teams. But before we get into that, tell us more about Kodat. What took you to Kodat? What does Kodat do? So I think we've all had a really interesting couple of years, um, just the nature of the world these days. But in combination, it sounds like you just went through this too. We had our, the birth of our second child. Uh, COVID was upon us. It was a great, if, if there is a silver lining of all of that uh, in terms of COVID, it was a good chance to reflect on what's important and what I wanted to do and where I was in my career. Uh, and it became clear joining a, a smaller company, it was the right time. It seemed like a fun adventure. And I looked at a lot of different options, talked to a lot of founders and CEOs and different roles in, in different industries, all tech, but really many, many different forms. 
Kodat stood out based on the people, just a great executive team. I talked to the a couple of the board members. It was, you know, a very, very strong foundation, excellent product market fit, uh, really poised for growth and a chance to double down, especially up market. The, their primary customers were large enterprises. The selling was not straightforward, um, which really matched the way that I, I liked to get things done at Slack and, and Salesforce. Um, and then it just really stood out in terms of uh, the opportunity for my experience to be really helpful at the stage of company Kodak was. It was about 70 employees or so uh, and um, you know, needing to scale to that 10 to 100 range in terms of revenue. Definitely, so, definitely. So Kodak, Kodak, I'll, I'll introduce you to what Kodak does. So Kodak's a single universal API which connects to over 30 systems used by small businesses. So a lot of Lloyd's customers would fall into this range. Um, anyone using QuickBooks or Zoho, uh, systems like that. And we provide access to their consented data. So they would put in their password and authorize access to Lloyd so that he can analyze their R&D tax crediting. Um, we standardize that data across all the different systems that we connect to and then layer insights on top of that so that you can start to spot irregularities and discrepancies, but primarily it's access to and standardization of that data, fully white labeled. Um, so we're behind the scenes at companies like Amex, PayPal, Brex, Pipe, Clearco, lots of hot companies up and down the market, uh, including we're proud to be working with Boast and fueling some of their efforts both to provide a seamless experience for those looking for R&D tax crediting but also make a smoother process for instant access to loans so that you can get paid before the government releases the check for your tax credits. Kodat is the best way um, to, to integrate financials into your platform. And I feel like, you know, this is a separate discussion, but I feel every company will become a fintech company. Like fintech is another layer, like the internet, the cloud, mobile, AI, and now it's fintech, right? And you guys are enabling that along with us and, and many others in the space. Awesome, fantastic. So, you know, we, we alluded to this Dropbox, Slack, they all said they didn't need sales teams and then they all now have massive sales teams. When is the right time to bring in a sales leader? The right time to bring in a sales leader. So uh, I think a lot of them probably did have some form of sales, even Atlassian. They said, we don't need sales, but they've got this weird little team called accounts. And yeah. now they have, they have sales, I think more overtly. Uh, one of the great leaders from Slack is now head of enterprise accounts or something, but it really is sales just done in a very specific way. Um, and at Slack, there was sales. It was just called accounts. Um, to your point, uh, at some point, most companies will kind of reach that maximum, maximum point you can get to without a true selling effort, without a team that's dedicated to understanding the needs of a particular customer and moving them proactively beyond where they currently are, whether that's no spend with your organization or whether that's like at Slack, we found that the product, the design and the engineering teams really understood Slack and didn't need a lot of selling or encouragement. And then the rest of the team, the go-to-market team, the legal team, operations, they weren't really prone to just picking up Slack and starting to use it. And so we needed to pour a little bit of attention and proactive love on those parts of the business to get them to see the light and use the, the tool across the whole organization. So the right time to bring in a sales leader is when you've recognized the need for some kind of a proactive outreach for your organization. Um, and then it's really hiring someone that can scale the organization well beyond where you are today and build the right functions in the right way. Yeah, and, and one of those elements, a lot of founders, you know, they've not hit product market fit. And they want to like start bringing sales leaders and whatnot. And I, I've seen for me personally, I've been a part of two failures before, um, is that that doesn't work out very well because, you know, nothing replaces the founder's vision of going and selling. And if you bring a sales leader when you haven't sold maybe five, six, when you don't have product market fit, it just creates a lot of stress. Um, is there any truth to that? Or maybe that's just my experience. I would, I think if you don't have product market fit, it's a tough place to operate in general. Uh, I've, I, I think I've only worked in places for the most part that have product market fit. I've definitely worked 
prior to Salesforce and companies that didn't have the products we needed to have to, to really win a lot of the, the market. But it was, they were in a pretty clear place that there was a fit. But I, so I can't speak to that from experience, but I imagine that's really hard. And it would require more tinkering and testing and getting your product in the hands of people that could become a place where you do have product market fit. I would definitely not just try and force it with a sales team if you don't have it though. If you're not, if you don't have willing participants in the selling process, that's a tough road to hoe. Yeah, because like, you know, you have an idea, your first job is validate the market, get five, 10 people to try it out. Then it's like product market fit. Can the founder or somebody on the founding team go and sell it? And oftentimes what you sell um, brings a lot of feedback based on usage and you're driving for high retention. And, and you know, in my last company, we went and hired salespeople and nobody made quota. They were extremely pissed off. The product didn't work. All the feedback was like, you know, we released something, but there was feedback to make it better, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, that product market fit, I agree with you, is the right phase to get started, right? So now you're a new sales leader, well, whether at Slack or at Kodak, where do you start? Like what are the first 30, 60, 90 days look like? So I was fortunate to step into a pretty well firing organization. We had revenue, we had big clients, we had some salespeople. The first thing that I did was start to analyze where we were winning, what the team looked like, get feedback, you know, obviously just start to, to put my ear to the ground. I was a bit shocked to learn that we didn't have things in place like accounts, like addresses were not populated in the CRM system. So coming from Salesforce, that just, that blew my mind a little bit. Um, so we had to do some things to get our house in order in order to really analyze where we were winning geographically from a you know, size of account perspective, and then start to build out a hiring plan that really matched what we were seeing both in pipeline and revenue and just kind of the forward-looking projections we had for different parts of the business. Um, and after that, set about really trying to find the right talent. We built scorecards and did things to make sure that uh, we knew what type of people we were looking for, the characteristics, the experiences. And then it's really been a, about half of my time focused on recruiting, interviewing, onboarding, uh, building out the team. Definitely. No, that's, that's fantastic. And then a lot of founders, they raise money and, and <laughs> founders like myself, who are not engineers come from uh, sort of, uh, or rather who are engineers don't, don't come from big sales or go to market backgrounds. They tend to have misaligned expectations. Sometimes I'm going to hire a sales leader. They're going to build us. They're going to hit this financial model that I presented to VCs. So how do you manage those expectations when you're coming in as a sales leader? I think it's sanity checking some of that. And, you know, we did, did some analysis on what the projections were and they seemed reasonable based on the size of opportunity that we saw with some of, you know, especially the big banks is a very obvious place for us to, to sell things. But we did analyze what the, the quota numbers were. We matched that to the hiring plan. I will say that I overestimated how quickly we could staff up in an environment like this. I think a lot of dry powder was deployed into FinTech companies that look a bit like us. Mm -hmm. We are a white labeled solution, so we're not out there. We're not a known brand. It's not like some of these companies that are consumer facing where you'd see their, their brand out there. So uh, I, I was used to this big army of recruiters, a big brand at Slack and Salesforce and building teams uh, at a bit higher velocity. So. That did catch me off guard, but we've brought in some amazing people um, and they are closing really fantastic deals. So um, validating the quota is a, is a really difficult thing to do as you enter an organization from the outside. How do you think about it though? How should, how should us or, or smaller companies or companies just trying to figure it out, how should they think about sales quotas? Is there, is there a magic formula? Is it more gut? I think a lot of it is gut. I think it's like, <laughs> Look at, look at the growth you put up last year. And I will say, build the model to show some seasonality. And if you're just adding sales to the machine for the first time, anticipate these spikes probably end of quarters, Q4. At Salesforce, that was a known thing. And we had a monthly drive. And at Slack, when we really turned on quotas, there was this huge spike in Q4 for the first time. And in the Slack channels, the engineers were like, what is happening? What is going on? 
why are all these deals closing? And they just didn't understand the dynamic. I would say build your models with some aggressive goals, but you know, make them, you know, just just a bit of a reach, not demoralizingly high. And then if you're off, recalibrate. You know, don't try and pick the, the five-year plan and stick to it. Call it for six months, recalibrate, see where you are. And I, I think there's a lot of effort that you can put, a lot of emphasis you can put on the effort, the behaviors, the early indications that are pre-revenue to show you whether you're on the right track. What are, what are some, some of those behaviors and early indications? Obviously, pipe gen, looking at pipe gen by sector, by region, by team uh, isn't an easy thing to focus on, but you know, meeting generation, some of the anecdotal feedback about where we're seeing interest, you know, again, regionally, by product, by segment, um, and then just starting to match that to where you're seeing the revenue actually come in. But keep the long view. Know that a small seed deal in most companies like ours this year yields big returns next year when we do the, work, the right work. So, so you know, and, and maybe there's a, a direct uh, answer here. And I'd rather have a Lobo in front of me than a front, frontal lobotomy. <laughs> that's, just, I, I, oh, that's, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, how should people think about quotas? Because I think that's the first step, right? Let's say, let's say you've got product market fit. You're at a million in ARR. Um, founder has been selling, right? And they bring in someone like yourself, external leader. Should the quota next year, and, and let's say this company has raised, I don't know, five, 10 million, right? I'm just hypothetical scenario here. Should the quota the next year be going from one to five? Should it be going from one to 10? Like, how should they think about quotas? Now, like, this is the scenario where the founder has been selling, sold the first maybe half a million to a million ARR. Maybe that's like 50 deals, right? So a new sales leader comes in. How do you think about it? As a sales leader, I would always want my quarter to be smaller, probably. But yeah. as a with an owner mentality, I would think like again, make it a stretch. This is so individual; it's really hard to give you something scientific here. But I would look at all the data you can as as objectively as you can, and try and not make it emotional. And of course, you want to go from one million to five or ten, but can you get there? And if you put your fingerprints on the right part of the business what sort of trajectory change could you really enact? What could you, and if the, the sales team doubles their quota because they do better than you anticipated, maybe that's fine. You know, you, if you have a, a comp plan that's tied to revenue, you're paying people for performance. So it's still this, you know, it's part of your, the margin that you anticipated paying. So I, I think acceleration is probably a tougher thing in an early stage company. You don't need to, double comp over 100% if you're not sure what the line should be for 100%. As you mature and grow, you've got a lot more science to build a comp plan so that you know that that territory with reasonable effort should yield that much revenue over the course of this year. You just have so much more evidence for that dirt, that patch year on year in terms of what it was producing so that an outsized result is really obvious. When we're talking about this early, there's so many variables that go into that equation that are unique to each business. It's really hard to give you perfect science, but I'd say make it a stretch, but allow them to blow it out and be really happy. And that especially your sales leaders are such a, a high point of leverage. It's important to, to keep them happy and fed and, and rewarded. Awesome. Fantastic. So I want to, I want to get into like the team now, like what are the, key hires you'd make as a sales leader. So you've been, say you come into a company that's product market fit, couple million in revenue. Now you need to build a sales team. You know, the founder has been selling, you know, there's product market fit because there's high retention. Um, like who do you hire? Sales ops, SDRs, sales engineers, account executives. Like what is that mix of people do you hire? And then the second thing is, uh, you know, piggybacking off of that, how do you identify the right candidates? And what does a comp look like? Good question. And again, not to like, not to dodge the question, but this one's individual. So I can speak to, especially what we're doing at Kodat and what I saw work well at Slack and Salesforce. But in companies like that, BDRs are really important. And I'd get them in 
probably earlier than you think if, if we're talking to an early stage founder. Uh, just starting to build awareness, starting to build pipelines, starting to soften the ground for the team that you'll hire after them is important. And they're often young early in their career and need a lot of care and feeding, but that's a really important function to bring in, especially if you're like Kodak, where a lot of our customers are these bigger enterprises. We're selling to all the top banks. And you're selling. a high ACV product, right? Like say like 20,000 20, and up ARR. You're not going to like it, Lloyd, but we're really expensive. No, I know. <laughs> but, but we're worth it. We're worth it. But yeah, so it's, we, it's a high ACV product, but we also work with very small fintechs that are just starting up and have entry point products for them. Um, but BDRs are a huge part of, of our machine and important to bring in early. So, so for people's benefit here, BDR is a business development rep or a sales yes, development rep. Sorry. And, and, and their whole job is to generate qualified meetings for salespeople by a combination of social selling uh, and email and cold calling and Whatever means necessary. They can do whatever they want. They have full free reign uh, at Kodak to get attention however they can. But they build awareness. So they're used interchangeably sometimes with SDRs. I think about the two as kind of discrete, but similar. BDRs are outbound. So you point them to big accounts and say, I need to get into the technology team at that bank or the, the business banking, like mm -hmm. the relationship managers at that bank and just point them in the right direction, give them some of the messaging that might work and let them go. SDRs would be inbound. So people that hit your website, qualifying leads in lots of organizations, they'd be promoted into BDRs and then they'd become your junior salespeople. And so when you think about the organization, that's, I mean, one of your questions further on is 10 Xing. Think about a destination company. Eventually when you're 10 X the size, when you have new college grads enter your company that have the right DNA, the right attitude, the drive, the hunger, and you give them an entry point where they learn, they're just picking up the phone and answering soft inbound leads. And then they're getting outbound and breaking into companies you never thought you'd have any conversations with. And then they start closing deals, smaller deals, high velocity, and grow into leadership or other roles in your company. But um, we've kind of gone off road a little bit here, Lloyd. Do you no, want to get no. back to the roles? No, no, but I think, I think that is perfect, right? Like whenever you hire somebody, hire them with a path is, is what I got out of it. Like SDRs are inbound, then they get promoted to BDR, which is outbound. I mean, we call them the same thing, BDR, SDR. Um, but yeah, inbound rep, because it's a little easier, outbound rep, then like you get into AE and then leadership. And it's a great path. People should feel like they're always growing in a company and they don't have to chase for that growth. You have the path laid out based on metrics. So let's, let's talk about the BDR metrics for a second here. But um, from, a, from a BDR perspective, you recommend hiring them before you have salespeople on the ground or you sort of- No, no, I, I would, sorry. I would hire them sooner than you think you probably need them. That's different for every company. And it, if you have a lot of inbound and you're a brand that's visible, Maybe you need SDRs to qualify inbound leads more. That's but let's say let's very, say you don't have uh, don't have a lot of inbound because inbound is also hard uh, to build. Then what is your what is the ideal ratio of BDR to salesperson to AE? One to three, one to five. It depends on the size of your deals. Probably you'd look at your acquisition costs in that sort of model pretty closely. I would think if you've got a high value product and you're selling it up market, like for my. Enterprise reps, I'll cover them much more closely, like one to two, one to three, because the revenue that those reps can yield is pretty high. Mm -hmm. With a with smaller team, you might do one to four, one to five, and just help them get into some of these accounts. And, and so that BDR to AE ratio, let's say, let's say it's uh, it's shy of or, or um, it, it's lower than 50K, let's call it 10 to 50K deals. One BDR is giving coverage to two to three reps north of 50K. One BDR is giving coverage to one to two reps. What percentage of quota um, is a BDR responsible for generating for those reps? 100%, 50%, like what is ideal that you've seen out there? It's usually, it's pretty high contribution for us. Um, and we we the metrics we pay based on are key, it's primarily meetings meeting set here, uh, it may shift to opportunities created. So there's a tighter connection to pipeline. I think the industry would, would favor that. The amount of opportunities created, not the dollar value necessarily, but just create 10 opportunities for the sale in a given month. Um, 
so they would with us it's probably 50 percent. the aes create a lot of the pipe themselves as well and then marketing kicks in uh, with events and, and demand gen awesome so like 30 to 50 percent and um and the how do you comp them i guess you comp them based on like sort of they have a base and then they have to hit a certain ot what does the bdr comp ideal comp look like ideal comp is some percent base and then maybe 30 percent variable 20 to 30 percent variable for meeting set or opportunities created and then some would pay based on the deals closed a percent of the revenue Awesome. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've seen in organizations and maybe you can, you can speak to this as well. Like some pay for meetings booked, but some pay for sales accepted lead, which is, you know, budget need authority time frame fit is the right kind of lead that that's moving from like a sort of uh, investigate to the next stage. And then they comp them based on that. Any thoughts on that? Like, what do you optimize for? You optimize for accepted lead or you optimize for just a meeting book? Uh, our current model, um, my team's going to watch this and say, oh, we're probably going to shift it. But our current model is meeting set. I would rather have opportunity creation and sales accepted lead. So it's Salesforce and Slack was always stage one created by the BDR. And when the meeting's held and the salesperson talks to them and says, great opportunity, Boast is going to be a great customer, move it to stage two, that triggers crediting for the BDR team. Yeah, 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 definitely, exactly. And then, and then some organizations what I've seen them do is um, to keep people motivated. They comp on meetings booked, and then they title tighter the controls, tighten the controls as uh, their ramp increases. Um, what is the ramp time on BDR that people should expect? Ideally, BDRs tend tend to ramp pretty quickly um, because they can often learn from each other, grab scripts, and just. You know, align with the AEs that they're they're with. I think they ramp much more quickly than senior account executives tend to. But yeah. three months, three months, they're they're pretty good around that. Awesome. I would say I, I thought when you said quick, I thought you meant like 30, 30 days or or 15 days, but that that sounds maybe fat maybe, fa maybe faster than that. So <laughs> 30, 30 to, to 90 days for real, real proficiency around 90 days. Awesome. And what are the key traits of a BDR? that you're looking for? Like, what are some key traits? Yeah, to, it, for BDRs, it's way more about the DNA than it is the experience, obviously. And so that business acumen for us is really important because the way, what I didn't mention is our API is bi-directional. So the banking use case, your use case, pulling information is pretty obvious. But then when you look at pushing information, like a point of sale system at a clothing store, reconciling payments, uh, for it back into QuickBooks for that business owner, it gets really complicated really fast and it can, it, it goes in a lot of different directions. So curiosity and business acumen are really high for us in particular. If you've got more of a point solution, those would probably be indexed lower than just passion and drive and scrappiness. But those are the things I, I tend to look for is curiosity, business acumen, coupled with passion and drive and scrappiness you know d1 sports players uh you know, people who have shown that they have a real like light in their eye for a topic when you all you have to do is ask them what they're they're passionate about or a proudest moment from school and you'll see the lights go on around something that maybe you didn't anticipate awesome so you know recapping this side of things we said you know hire bdr sooner than you think you need them they're great at generating pipe ramp time one to three months and should be generating 30 to 50 percent of pipe and you compensate them um 50 percent base and then the rest uh can be variable a 30 percent is variable and uh, i think bdrs yeah. are usually like 70 percent base and then a, a smaller variable okay. an account executive yeah so 70 percent base 30 percent variable that's fantastic and uh the preference is, is sort of comping them on the variable, on the qualified uh, sort of opportunities, but maybe you start off by compensating on meetings to keep them motivated. Now let's, mm -hmm. let's move to the AE. And, and we said like, you know, one BDR should be able to funnel th three, anywhere from two to four 
AEs at, at peak, and, and depending on the deal size, it may be less or more. So let's move into AEs then. At, uh, you know, what is the ideal AE profile? Um, what are their quotas like? Um, what does the comp look like? So ideal profile, it's really similar to the BDR, but you then couple it with experience. And so for a junior account executive, it, you kind of index more on those characteristics and couple it with a bit of experience where they've proven that they could be successful in a selling role. Um, I've, I've hired people even at Kodak who didn't have traditional selling experience. So I think it's important to continue to index more heavily on the characteristics than than necessarily a perfect set of experiences. Um, for senior reps, it's really about people that have proven that they can get it done in a selling environment with a direct selling quota and really able to sell value and a solution in a bunch of different ways. So not the, the one trick pony where you could just you know, show up and deliver the same deck every time and just there's no variation in the way that the product is used. And there are lots of great companies out there that, that work a lot like that. But even Slack, it was very different to get people to buy and spend a lot to, to, do, to make organizational change happen and uh, revamp parts of their operation. And at Kodak, we need to index on people that can do great discovery, come up with a unique solution for the business that's gonna use the data supplied by or sent through our API. And um, so we really need to focus on people who have proven that they can handle complexity, do some solution oriented selling and, and aren't just in a, like a rinse and repeat type of model. Yeah, and definitely. And when you're hiring AEs, what I found is, uh, you know, from failures and successes is hiring people who've sold, there, this, there has to be some similarity. The experience um, brings a lot of value, particularly if they've sold the same deal size into similar markets or, or whatever have you. But what is the ideal experience uh, after which you find like diminishing returns, you would say for an AE? Uh, we've got two teams. One team's focused on selling into banks and just, if you think about where the mothballs are in the industry, that's the team that's focused on like the old school industries and the bigger accounts. And there, I want people who have sold ideally to financial institutions or insurance or government. Like I, I just need to know that they can stick in it for the long haul, deal with lots of maybe unnecessary complexity, be able to, to navigate that complexity and just not get discouraged if it takes a long time to get a big bank to, to purchase something. The other team is focused on everything else. That would be selling our product to Amazon and Shopify and Stripe and, uh, and Apple. And so that's a really different skill set. And so for them, the ideal skills are being adaptive, being curious, being creative. And like you know, a, a rep that sold BI software or you know, Salesforce, where you have to like their product portfolio is huge. So if you sell all those products, you have to be very adaptive and able to pull a bunch of different stories together to come up with a solution for, for a different type of company. So I, I test for that and I do in our, our interview process. Definitely. Um, speaking of interview process, what are your top two favorite questions that you ask everyone in, uh, in interviews, the salespeople? Oh, I can't give away my favorite ones to stump people. Uh, I, I love to ask people about their proudest moment. I think I highlighted that earlier, but you just, I, I try and really get to understand people. And we, in our interview process, we go way back and that's not a surprise or a secret. We, we try and get to know people's origin story and just understand what makes them them and the decisions they've made and like truly why they made different. You know, you're, you graduated from college, where was your head? Instead of like, oh Lloyd, how did you choose to, to start Boast? But like, really, where was your head? What were your options? What were you thinking about at that stage? And just trying to be ruthlessly open-ended in our questions as we take someone through their career journey and try and truly understand what makes them them and why they made the choices they made. Definitely, you know, that's, that's fantastic. And then the A comp, before I move to the next role, um, ideally it's 50-50 or? I th uh, yeah, I like the 50-50. It can be 50 to 70% base is what I've seen. 
I like 50 50 because you get people who will bet on themselves. And if they're good, they're going to blow it out and make more. And, uh, you yeah, know, they're not looking for that security. You want AEs that are willing to step into a little bit of risk and, and back themselves. Definitely. And then what is, you know, as you're going from, let's say, 10 million to 20, 30, 40 million, what is the ideal team size? Um, and at what point do you need like sales operations? So let's let's look at the ideal team design and structure. And then let's look at some of the support functions that you can't do without. I would say sales enablement and sales operations slash strategy are really important to add around 10 million for most organizations. And it's, it's probably one of those things that sooner than you think you might wanna make that investment, but it's critical, especially if you're about to go into hyper growth or significant growth like we are. It's an indispensable partner for me, both of those, to come up with the onboarding program and train the team we already have and you know, get a baseline um, and then really analyze like how we're doing, help me see around corners uh, from a strategy perspective. And then just bed down the systems and the process. Uh, those two functions are really critical for any enterprise SaaS company. And um, they will go from you know, a position and a role to a function pretty quickly. Uh, as you go through that 10 to 100 million range, you'd have, you'd have a function by the time you get you know, halfway through that, probably 50 million, you've got a few people handling both of those, both of those roles. Definitely. And, um, you know, on the A side, I forgot to ask, what, what's the ideal ramp time? That and depends on the seniority. It totally depends on your product, you know, your sales cycle, things like that. The pipeline they'd walk into. Uh, I'm a big fan of black and white versus gray. If things are gray, I'm the arbiter of all kinds of weird questions about account things. And so I would move a territory like it's equitable with a lot of the deals, meaning they get some pipeline. So yeah. when they step into the organization, it's not just barren ground. They've got something to work on that's got a little life in it. And that aids their ramp time. It allows them a softer landing into the organization and they're able to, to get their feet under them more quickly. So I, for a mid-market SMB rep, probably within three months, they're pretty self-sufficient. Um, we're always a collaborative team. We work really closely with one another, but they can do their own demos, they're closing deals, they're, they're up and running. And an enterprise rep, when you get to scale, you hand them a dozen accounts. Some of them might take a while to really get things going, but same mentality where we probably rip good accounts off of other seasoned reps and hand them to someone that comes in the organization. It's not just cold one, cold accounts. Some of them would probably have some momentum. And then quota attainment is, is just probably a lagging indicator, right? What are some leading indicators you watch out for to make sure that these BDRs are going to hit their numbers, AEs are going to hit their numbers, enterprise reps are going to hit their numbers? Yeah, uh, activity level. So I think, I mean, it's formulaic. You can have like the really baseline activity level, like email sent, calls placed, and then meetings. And it used to be really interesting at Slack where we could say BP or director plus meetings. It's hard to get those, right? That's pretty indicative of you know, doing good work and you can separate the team pretty categorically and say, all right, look how many director level meetings they have, the pipe gen, the closed revenue. You can you know, stitch those metrics together in a pretty clean line. Selling into banks, there are lots of VPs. There's like title proliferation, so it's not, not as easy to see at Kodat I've found in the data. It's not as, but that, that's a, if you can do that with your organization, with your type of technology, that's a nice way to say, you're not just emailing a bunch of people, but you're getting the senior level contacts and having meetings with them. Then it should yield pipe generation or not. If not, you can diagnose what's happening there, uh, which should yield closed revenue after a, a reasonable sales cycle. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are some questions around ramp here, but like, you know, this generally ties into onboarding, right? So you hired these reps um, at, at, you know, AEs have like three to six months ramp, let's say enterprise AEs maybe longer, BDRs one to three months, you have their quotas. What does that ramp period that onboarding look like? Rob's asking if you have a certification period. We do. So one of the things that 
I hired, I've been at Kodak less than a year. I, I told you I spent a few months just figuring things out, trying to get accounts and getting accounts on the, the uh, account addresses and the, the accounts cleaned up was a big effort, making sense of all of it. And so we hired sales enablement four months ago. And I've got a great partner who actually came from Salesforce and is building that out globally across all the functions. And we don't have a certification program yet, but we are moving in the direction of having a baseline onboarding program for everybody that's, that's customer facing that comes into the organization. And then eventually building curriculum that would splinter off based on role. Because there's definitely things you train an enterprise salesperson on that you wouldn't train a BDR on. There's definitely training for a, we haven't talked about SEs, but solution engineer, uh, customer success, there are all these tangential roles that have really different learning paths and, and baseline curriculums. Definitely. And so what are, what are some key elements of those for BDR, a uh, enterprise, a key elements that you need to touch on? You don't have to be like, you know, well, there's not things that are going to be specific for Kodad and Slack, but really like what are some key things people should put in there? Um, you know, a, a lot of people tend to put very theoretical playbooks that, you know, people don't retain. Sounds like you have a visitor. Uh, so so it, it, that will depend on your company, but they're obviously just like the core building blocks of any organization. You have to understand, and, and we do a lot of training for just broad employees across the company, like a product training and you know, CEO welcome, things like that. For go-to-market particular, in particular, it's operational things like how to operate in Salesforce, how to build a quote if you're an account executive, um, messaging, positioning, objection handling, you know, very specific things for BDRs and account executives, um, for SEs and AEs, it's demoing. How do, you, how do you even begin to find the demo account? How do you set one up? What level of customization do you have? So those are just table stakes for anyone that comes into the organization that you can train them on and, and get them ramped up much more quickly. Definitely. There's a question here. Uh, what's your favorite way to help enterprise AEs have a chance to hit OT during ramp with like six to nine month sales cycles? Favorite way. Uh, as soon as we give them accounts, to tier the accounts and meet with them and say, take me through your top three to five and let's just rip the cover off of them and let's partner on them or bring in people from the extended team and just help them go farther faster. And if, if it doesn't seem like they've chosen the right top focus accounts, you know, help them recalibrate that. But I think that's a nice way to show where their head is, show how much they're picking up what they are going to be focused on and then have a meaningful discussion about it a subset of those accounts and help them get into them, help partner with them. Definitely. And then um, let's talk about like org design, right? Like how do you organize territories? Is it revenue based? Is it territory based? Is it like, how do you think about that? Let's say you have like a North America wide coverage. Territories, I mean, that's an interesting one. And I, that answer probably looks different today than it did three years ago for most companies. Yeah. Because like now we have an interesting opportunity. If we try and find silver linings in this catastrophe, uh, the ability to let, worry less about region and think more about product, vertical, that sort of specificity. Like I've got a, a leader based in New York who covers the banks and he, he has people spread out all over the place to cover the banks. but. It's less about the region in which you live, and it's more about your, your ability to articulate the solution for a particular product, for a particular subset of the customer base at this point. And I, mean, I just, I believe at some point, people are gonna come back and wanna shake hands and kiss babies. It will be somewhat more normal. And I, I've been to a couple of conferences and maybe I'll see you in Vegas at Money 2020, but <laughs> in some places, they're really happy to have face-to-face -face meetings and we're doing a little bit of it. And I'm in our office in New York today. But um, then once we get a bit more of that, where we're meeting face-to-face -face with customers, especially with the big accounts, I think regional focus makes a lot of sense for, for us, especially with, with big deals, with big customers. 
being able to see them and walk the halls, there's something magic that happens that you don't get between back-to-back -back Zoom calls. So you got to get on planes, trains, and automobiles there. Um, I, I could be wrong. I could be totally wrong. But I think for selling to big banks, they'll still want us to, to show up and, and put in the effort and, and have a meal with them in, you in know, a lot of cases. You know, I, I, I hold, we host so many events, right? Hundreds of events. And I fundamentally believe that anytime you incorporate more than two senses, they were like sound and sight right now, but taste, touch, smell, you have the opportunity to build stronger connections, like breaking bread with people is, is one great way, right? Uh, and so there's, a, there's data that, that proves that is the case, uh, right? Get on, get on flights, meet, meet people. Uh, there is there is data to prove that. Um, Greg asks here any suggested ratios of BDR's account executives to the number of enterprise prospects. Like, does that factor in? Uh, no, I I don't think about that as much as like the ratios of number of accounts to the the tier of account executive personally. Where if you just can't like I can't give one account executive. Bank of America and Wells Fargo and JP Morgan and Goldman and have them do those justice. So it's more, my brain is more focused on how much could that account executive reasonably cover when I look at accounts of that size in terms of the level of care we should provide them. And then the level of importance is kind of where I think about the mapping of BDR to the account executives and what the re revenue is we could expect to generate out of the set of account executives we map the BDR to. Definitely. And then one thing we missed on the on the comp model here is like when you comp these AEs, right? You're paying them on the initial agreement. What is the best practice? Or you're paying them on, on recurring MRR? It depends. So at, at a lot of organizations, you'd be paid primarily like 90% on the net new or growth or upgrade revenue. So any expansion which lots of companies confusingly called ACV. I actually like the acronym, but annual contract value, which is really net or incremental ACV, but that's the primary driver for most of us SaaS companies is the growth that an AE drives in an existing account and a new account, what have you. And then some renewal focus, because I know both Lloyd and I are big believers in doing the right thing for your customer and exceeding expectations, not because, you know, it sounds nice, but because it's the right thing to do and you'll probably have better outcomes and live longer. But renewals are important. Yeah, implementation is important. Success is important. So some orientation for those that are really money driven in the comp plan, maybe 10% of their comp plan, 20% of their, their variable around renewal is helpful. So whatever that percentage means for you, um, some way to keep them focused on implementation, success, renewal is important. Awesome. I'm going to get into selling styles and then I'm going to start uh, taking uh, the audience questions in rapid fire. We may have to go like five minutes over here, but what are the different selling styles and when to use each? Like, for example, what works with complex products? Talk about that discovery in challenging selling environments. Yeah, so... There are lots of selling styles and frameworks like transactional selling is overtly selling your product. That's what we all think of salespeople. That's why a lot of people try and get out of sales because they're used to that like used car salesman type of sales. There's a really respectable form of sales. I'm very proud to have it in my title, um, but it's because like consultative or solution-based selling, that style of selling where you truly seek to understand before you seek to pitch or provide a solution. And you really try and understand how important it is, what your other priorities are. You get to know things way beyond the context of how your product fits into that organization because it better helps you say something and position something that will really provide. Uh, there's a great uh, trainer from Salesforce, Eli Cohen, who is now doing his own sales enablement. I'd encourage you to look at saleshood, but um, he always talked about transformational, emotional, and quantifiable. And the only way to deliver a message to an organization, especially a complex enterprise organization, is to do great discovery and find what will be transformational for them and the person you're selling to or the people 
would be emotionally rewarding for them and connected and have positive benefit and ROI that they could stand behind to their CFO and say, we need to make this purchase and here's why. And if you align all three of those things, um, you've done great work, asked a lot of the right questions, you've connected with them, um, and you can only do that with some form of solution selling, I believe. And they're all kind of variations on the same theme, whether it's Spin or Solution or Sandler. I, I like Sandler. Um, and I think coupling that with challenger, some challenger mentality is important because otherwise you just ask a bunch of questions and we ran into this at Slack where people are like, why are you asking me these questions about my operation and how this department works with that department? Like, I don't understand where you're going. And we realized we had to reset the team and start with a point of view, a perspective, a hypothesis for how we would transform them. So we had to do research before we got to those calls and come up with a real under understanding or guess that we would challenge and test and let them rip apart and say, no, you're wrong but I like where your head is and here's, here's what we really care about and how we might, you might be able to help us. So that, that just helped us set context for discovery. And they, you know, sometimes it was wrong, but that's okay. And we would, we'd rebuild it stronger. Definitely. What's, what's the most complex sales you discovery call you've been in and, and what were some key learnings there? Uh, I, 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 we, we sold Slack to semiconductor companies we sold Slack, like we had, Netflix was a great account and they were using it on the corporate side without us doing too much. And then we expanded it to the production side of, Net, of Netflix. And that was like a huge effort. And our team was down in LA helping the tech teams and the production teams and the, you know, every part of that production side of, of Netflix that makes all the shows we love, Ozark, the documentaries, think about how Slack could help them pick the right scripts, cast, the shoot locations and catering and everything through to post-production and getting things onto the site. And that was a really interesting, challenging, multifaceted discovery session, which was, wasn't just a discovery call. It's not a moment in time discovery. It's a, a process and discovery was part of every one of those touch points we had uh, as we went through the journey of helping them see how Slack could play a role. They already had a lot of systems they built, but as a layer on top of all that technology, Slack was a ribbon that ran through from picking the script to pushing it out onto the Netflix site. So that was a fun one. It's amazing. Awesome. And um, in, in the ideal world, uh, right at a company that's at scale, what percentage of opportunities should be inbound versus outbound that you find? And, and any sales leader will tell you they want more inbound. I don't have enough inbound, but uh, that's... Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's a magic percentage, but it, it's usually a lot that's outbound. For enterprise sales teams, there's always a lot that's outbound. If you get 10 to 20% inbound, you're doing well. I, I would caveat that and say, there's marketing generated and there's marketing influenced. And there's a lot of attribution that's lost along the way that's really helpful. There's ground softening from PR, there's you know demand gen, that maybe like the lead that turns into the opportunity isn't accredited back to that original lead but then they come to an event they're touched you know through a bunch of different campaigns you know they read some white papers and all of that is marketing and so there's a great feature in salesforce called campaign uh, influence it's on the opportunity and you can attach a whole bunch of marketing touches to a deal and then show attribution amongst the sales efforts and the marketing efforts and try and bridge the gap between what part was truly sales driven and what part was influenced by the marketing team. You know, the, there's a missing product in the market and maybe let's call it sales glue or whatever, but like multi-channel attribution is the hardest thing. And, and sales rep, reps usually put last touch or most organizations do last touch attribution versus like, you know, this influence by PR or events uh, and whatnot. So that that's uh, interesting uh, to note, but I'll, I'll share like sort of example from us in a sense. We went from, boot, we bootstrapped the company we're north of eight figures, ARR growing, you know, 2X year over year. Um, up until last year, a good 40, 50% came from referrals because of course we run this big traction community and maybe it was like something like 60, I think. Um, and, and we had four uh, sales reps. They were all called business directors of business development. They were all hitting quota. They were closing more like community, uh, a, a version of community management plus sales. 
This year we started adding sales development and for the last couple of months, sales development is, or, or BDR outbound is contributing to 50% of our new logos. And so I've, I've formulated this thesis that you can build a sizable company servicing one kind of customer coming through one kind of channel, getting one kind of service. So you know, a lot of people try to think like, oh, inbound, outbound and whatnot. But if you're crushing it with outbound, just double down on that. Why go and try to figure out inbound? Because it's not easy. All right. And so now our mix is like probably 30, 40% BDR, um, probably another 30 or so percent um, uh, referrals, and then the rest small percent, uh, I think 40% in, inbound, uh, or, or sorry, 40% referrals, and then like a small percent inbound. And we're trying to figure out inbound. But I think if you've nailed one thing, like you said, in, in, in larger enterprise companies, just, just do that, right? Maybe. But just to challenge that, might your your drive towards inbound just soften the ground for your outbound. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know how you would separate the two. You just, you're going to, in doing inbound and demand gen, you're going to get a lot of people more aware of who you are. And then your BDR is a lot of an easier time. That's and and it's also it definitions. Familiar. Yeah. It's also yeah. definitions, right? Like what is the definition of inbound? Most organizations look at inbound as, oh, somebody found you on Google. To me, like that's not inbound. Inbound is also like we do, if, uh, like a hundred webinars a year, hundreds of people are joining. To me, that's a form of inbound because it creates brand awareness For sure. and then it drives like, you know, PR, everything, right? So that marketing influenced, I think is key versus marketing you know, totally generated. What's in your tech sales tech stack? I mean, you're a veteran of sales. Of course you worked at Salesforce and Salesforce is table stakes. Everyone needs to have Salesforce, but how do you enable your team? What's the, what does the tech stack look like? You won't be surprised. Salesforce, Slack, uh, LinkedIn, obviously is navigator in, indispensable. Sales navigator, sure. When Microsoft picked that up, I was like mortified because I thought this <laughs> indispensable <laughs> tool. I'm in there. All, my wife's in Instagram. I'm in LinkedIn all the time, and um, I just it's such a great way to form true connections. And it's I actually a lot of. BDRs will send out an invite to link when they've never met anyone. And I, I actually don't think that's the right method. And I'd be surprised if many of us would accept a random link just because it's a tax. And my team's like, oh, I see you know this person who I don't really know. It's just some BDR that, that sent me a nice message and I accepted their connection. Anyway, so LinkedIn, of course, is great. Sales Navigator. Uh, we have Zoom Info to enrich the accounts. I talked a lot about how painful that was. Zoom info is great for appending a lot of interesting information so we can slice and dice and dissect the, the territories. Uh, Pardot we have, we're currently implementing that to try to amplify our efforts and get some automation and outreach. Um, Sales Loft, we use that mostly the BDRs, set up a cadence. So it's like a drip feed at Adloy to the campaign. It'll send you the right message at just the right time that hopefully looks like I was thinking of you at the right time, but it's really an automated drip feed. It's got a dialer too for calls. I don't, I don't know who dials calls. Who, I don't know, right. I think we do have probably a, a prompt to dial up, dial the phone, but we, it's the calls are part of the sequencing, but I think a lot more of it is LinkedIn messaging and emails um, and other outreach, but people do dial the phone. I think it more prompts you. It might have a dialer. I'm not, not sure. No, no, I and then we just if, bought WorkRamp. Go what ahead. is WorkRamp? That's an LMS. So that'll help with onboarding and scaling. So we don't have to do live classes for all the hires we're making, yeah. but we can build curriculum and that will help us with forking it so that we have curriculum for everyone that's customer facing. And then depending on your role, you'll get a different set of, of trainings that are delivered by people across the team. Awesome. And then you said you use Gong as well or no? We don't have Gong yet. We're looking at Gong and Chorus. Okay. Um, Chorus, which was just picked up by Zoom Info. Uh, to, the challenge we're having, frankly, with that is if we're calling a bank and we're talking to like the, the underwriting team at a bank, are they going to be open? Will they change their behavior based on it being recorded or will they always tell us to turn it off? And it's contempt before investigation, I guess, but we're, that's the discussion we're having with these teams to say, what do you see from highly regulated 
organ highly regulated software, like those who sell into finance, does it work? Do, do the customers receive it well? But the benefits to that are undisputed. So if you're not selling the banks, that I think we rolled it out at Slack. I didn't think it would go very well with our enterprise team. I was like, yeah, you know, BDRs, of course, enterprise, we'll see. And our enterprise team loved it. The AEs loved it because they learned from each other when they had a great call and they crushed the objection handling, they'd get shared around. And, you know, a lot of people are fed by that, not just the, the commission, you know, the recognition and reward from a system like Gong, it's real. It's just, you don't want to flag the bad, bad calls and send them out to the team and say, never do this. I think that would diminish the participation. And then Definitely. we're also looking at Clary and Inside Squared at some point to help us get a better handle on just the, all the different signal that's in the machine well, that is hard to pick up, up on in manual reports. Sales tech is getting more and more expensive and it's almost probably going to be at some point the same as <laughs> the rep comp maybe. I, I hope not. But um, one question to, to close things out here. There's a lot of buzz about account-based marketing. How do you guys think about it? What is the ideal way to leverage that for companies? Uh, it's an interesting one. I, so Salesforce is just a content machine. They're, they're a machine in so many ways. So account-based marketing there, like when I, I led teams in Australia and I had someone that would ghostwrite stuff for me where you have a chat like this and then a, an article would appear in Australian English and they would release that. And so that makes ABM easier because you can create hyper-targeted content for a stakeholder, a niche stakeholder and a niche account and go right for one of your top accounts. Then there's like broad based demand gen that's on the other end of the spectrum. That's like, you're trying to catch as many people with one message and it's super diluted and not specific. I think there's something in the middle that's really helpful where it's like, know the cohort to the profile of the key stakeholders. Like what does that underwriter at the bank care about? What is the transformation oriented person at the bank? What do they really care about? What keeps them up at night? What are their priorities? And can we write things that will be pretty good for a broad set of that persona? Like, I think that's a better way to think for me to think about account-based marketing, especially with the lean team we have. We're still only 170 people globally. You know, we've got a scrappy marketing team, but to saddle them with getting just the right message to Lloyd Lobo, that's a tough way to go versus all right, if we've got the CEOs of these super innovative, great companies, what might they be tuned into? And how can we, how can we raise their awareness and get just the, the flicker so that they answer the phone if we're dialing them or respond to the email and, um, and just begin that conversation? Definitely. You know, that's fantastic. Actually, I want to take a couple more. As companies now, you know, you could product market fit, you've got, you figure out one repeatable, scalable channel. So you figured out outbound, you figure out the sale team, it's working. How do you strive towards revenue growth of 10X? What are some elements you need to have in place? I love the 10Xing mentality. So the Alan Shim from Slack, their CFO, was always thinking this way. And he, you know, from an operational perspective, a systems perspective, um, whenever, you know, when I chatted with him, it was always about like, how do we 10 X what we're doing? And it, in some ways it's really about just manifesting destiny, like plan for that and think about the interdependencies and the barriers to getting to 10 X. And it's not just revenue. Like if you're 10 X, the size and team, you've got a totally different stru structure, different org chart, different like needs from a, like a, a technology perspective from a systems perspective, there's so much that would break on your path from where you are today to 10X that size. And so, you know, think about the steps, the logical steps and breakpoints to get from where you are to 10X where you are, and then start to build the machine that, that takes you on that journey. And I, you can, I'm sure, pick the brains of people who are double your size and have seen it and like they've lived through and have scars on their back and you don't need to waste their pain. You could talk how big is and, how big is your sales team right now at Coda? We have uh, a team of almost fifteen or so in the U.S. and about the same size in, in EMEA. 
so 30 or so, but lots of tangential roles in customer success and other functions. And is it set up like a pod structure? Is it a self-directed team? Like, how do you look at it? Like, uh, like you have like two BDR, like a BDR and four AEs and that's a pod. Like, how is it actually structured? I'm curious. The BDRs have discrete mapping to account executives to get the partnership going and the collaboration. Um, some do pod structures in other organizations, but um, that will continue to be you know, one BDR to three or four account executives with more specificity as we grow the teams so that you'd have a few BDRs mapped to a, a single team. And uh, in terms of the pod structure, the, the SEs are, for now, as we're small and growing, they cover everything. And we have one that's a bit more junior and a couple that are a bit more senior. And those that are more senior are covering all sorts of accounts. Okay, We've got so one in the UK that's really focused on selling into commerce yeah. and payments, who's just a weapon and knows that really well, who we leverage in the US. So one of your questions was, was around like international. I would say don't go physically until you've proven it remotely. And we did a lot from the UK where we're headquartered before we put feet on the ground in the United States. That's we amazing. Clients, As we had wins, yeah. I would imagine that you guys are a US company unless, unless you told me that. And then do you have sales managers within you? Like who are managing these, these A's or like, is there room for that or how? Yeah, sales directors and managers, depending on the seniority of the team members. So mid-market and then two directors in the US for the, uh, the banking and the, the other accounts. And, and then what is the their reporting, ideal reporting structure? Uh, things tend to break around four direct in terms of leaders. Mm -hmm. And so as the organization scales, three to five, five directs from a leadership perspective is probably where you want to start scaling and layering and putting in some other, some other functions. Um, but and I think five to seven AEs, depending on the seniority, is a good ratio. To, to one manager. And one then manager. Yeah. And then, and then do BDRs have a dedicated manager or do you recommend they report into the sales manager? I would not report them into the sales manager. If you're, if you're an enterprise sales manager and you're chasing big deals, are you going to onboard a BDR? Not all of them will onboard a BDR that well. I'll just say that. You, you much be, like That's a special skill. You've got someone that knows how to coach and get people fired up. And it's a, it's a really different type of leadership. So I, I would put them under one BDR leader who knows how to just break into organizations, work with core skills, like it's like really different skill set than doing a, an org chart and a, an account plan for a very strategic account. Makes sense. And your BDRs report into sales, not marketing, right? I mean, I've seen it both ways. Sales. That's your talent feeder. So you kind of want them they won't all stay in sales. I, I'm a big believer in them, them going wherever suits their interest and their career choice. But lots of them, if you do it right, will turn into the best AEs you have in the organization. So you want that same mentality, that same profile, and you want to groom them into amazing contributors to your leadership team or senior AE positions. Awesome. Now, you know, to close things out, actually, um, What's the one piece of advice, maybe unconventional, that you have for founders and sales leaders that doesn't sort of get like, you know, uh, enough uh, recognition, you know, maybe? Uh, that doesn't get, I just, I think there's, there's not enough focus on just have fun and be fun, be fun to work with, be fun to buy from. And I think we get so wrapped up in what we think is very serious stuff. And it's not, you know, like we're not curing disease here in most cases. Maybe some of the, the founders and oh. the leaders on this call are curing disease and God, God bless. We're not. We're helping make, you know, SMB life better as they interact with services. But it just be fun to, to work with inside of the organization and with your customers instead of taking it all so seriously. I think authenticity just goes a long way. And that's probably not news to anyone that's on this call, but I think that genuine nature and just keeping things fun is really important for, for scaling what you're doing. because it gets more serious and 
and warp sometimes as you as you get bigger. Definitely. And and the final thing, I mean, everyone wants to know some resources, books. What do you recommend? What do you give to your team? Like, you know, as sales leaders or new sales guys? Uh, we there's a book I love that's kind of old school called Selling to the C Suite. And it's all about just like becoming a trusted advisor and really like it's just it's not it's like Dale Carnegie stuff. It's just it's old, it's old as time, but it doesn't change. And it's about how to be ready for a CEO conversation, what, how to ask for a repeat visit when you go do a lot of work with the people that work for them. It's just how to operate at that level of an organization. Great book. And then Never Split the Difference is a great one. It's a hostage negotiator for the FBI that talks about just core negotiation skills. Um, so those two books are top of mind ones that I think uh, are, are pretty, they're worth a read. Definitely. And the day, when you say Dale Carnegie, I have to mention how to win friends and influence people. That's what it's I was the, referring to. Yeah. Is the it's first book a, I read. It's a classic. It's a classic. It's, it's like how people should behave. This is awesome. It's been fantastic. It's very rare that we go 10, 15 minutes off the top of the hour. Craig, what a great pleasure. I learned a ton, took some notes. Love and peace. Wishing you great success. Lloyd, thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Thank you.